Imagine the iPhone without an app store, third-party apps, or even the ability to copy and paste text. That's just some of the limitations to Apple's first iOS version. This is iOS 1.0, which shipped with the first generation iPhone on the 29th of June 2007, almost 18 years ago. Despite iOS 1 being very bare bones, it has cemented most of the design of iOS, which can still be seen in iOS 18, from the layout of certain menus to some of the animations. This is the very beginning of the phone that changed a lot about how we interact with phones. Getting iOS 1.0 installed wasn't easy, as it had been updated to 3.1.3. Thankfully, this iPhone lacks Apple's online signature requirements, meaning we don't need Apple's approval to downgrade, something prohibited on every iPhone model since the 3GS. However, it's not a straightforward process. iOS 1.0 will only run on selected early first-generation models within a certain serial number range. The third digit must be a 7, and the subsequent two numbers being less than 49. Additionally, you'll need access to Windows XP and iTunes 7. My first mistake was using a 64-bit version of Windows XP. Both 32 and 64-bit versions of iTunes wouldn't install. And while iTunes 7 did, it shows an error on launch that it's not installed properly. It failed to install any of the iPhone drivers, so it wouldn't even detect the iPhone when plugged in. With the 32-bit version of XP, things were looking up. But it still wasn't without some glitches. The device had to be restored four times once to iOS 3.1.3, three times to iOS 1.1.4, and once to iOS 1.0. If you attempt to downgrade straight to iOS 1.0, it fails instantly. The multi-restore downgrade ensures the baseband is downgraded before 1.0 is installed. Some of the restores are expected to fail, but once the baseband is repaired, the phone will successfully restore. Throughout this process, I discovered iOS 1 even has a repair message. It wasn't a smooth process, and I experienced several dilemmas before getting it booting iOS 1.0. Once installed, we can experience the iPhone as if we've purchased it on day one. The iPhone launched without an app or music store. So quite simply, what you got with your iPhone was it. There was no extra pages, no notification center, no control center, not even a contacts app. Users were expected to experience third-party websites and widgets using Safari. The only apps consisted of text, calendar, stocks, Google Maps, weather, a calculator, something iPad users had to wait till iOS 18 for, a camera app with only two buttons, one to take an image, and one to view the photo library, there was no focus, no zoom, no video, and the quality was just that of a raw 2 megapixel camera. Also included was a photos app, there was one dedicated to YouTube, something Apple would include until iOS version 6, when Google wanted greater control of their app. The clock app, which for some reason has a running timer set to end in exactly a year's time. A notes app, to take notes, that can't keep up with my typing. Of course, there's also a phone app, which houses contacts rather than having it in a dedicated app. You can set up your Yahoo Mail, AOL or .Mac email in the Mail app. .Mac being the predecessor to iCloud. And we can't forget Safari, the iPhone's controversial web browser, which famously lacked Adobe Flash Player, which a large portion of the web relied upon in 2007. Steve Jobs even released a press release to counter the backlash. Flash was never added to the iPhone, with Adobe ending updates in December 2020. Lastly is the iPod app, or music as it's more commonly known today, 
content having to be synced from a computer. The iPhone didn't yet support home screen wallpapers and brightness had to be adjusted in settings. The lack of some basic features phone users in 2007 wanted left them searching for a solution. This would lead to the first jailbreak tools, which were designed to add functionality to the iPhone which it did not yet have, or to allow it to be used on networks other than AT&T in the US. Of course, over time, some of these jailbreak features were implemented into stock iOS. Although you did have the ability to set a passcode. But unlike iPhones today, there was no timeout after five incorrect attempts. Instead, it goes straight to a message saying connect to iTunes. After switching the screen on and off a few times, it appears to have unlocked again, allowing for another attempt. But by far the strangest thing about iOS 1.0 is the low battery screen. Unlike newer versions of iOS, there is no low battery warning notifications. Instead, the device appears as though it's switched off and shows an empty battery icon that says, please connect to power. Pressing the power button twice brings the lock screen back up. The battery management in this first version of iOS is very poor. The phone displays as having an almost fully charged battery, but keeps turning off and displaying the battery flat icon. So this is it, Apple's first iPhone and their first mobile operating system. This phone might have lacked 3G, couldn't record video, and been without third-party app support, but the iPhone would go on to change how we communicate iOS version 1.1 added the iTunes Store, which was released alongside the iPod Touch. The iPod Touch would require payment for major software upgrades. Version 1.1.3 would allow you to rearrange apps on the home screen, as well as save shortcuts to websites in what would be the first sort of third-party apps the iPhone would see. It wouldn't be until iOS version 2 that the App Store would make the iPhone into the phone we know today. And on that note, this has been a huge FV's video. If you like what you saw, consider subscribing and check out the phone restoration playlist for more videos just like this one. And if you're looking for any used devices, be sure to check out my online store, link for which is down in the description. That's all for this video, and I'll catch you guys next time.